questions as I lecture. If there's anything that doesn't make sense, just go ahead and ask. It's quite possible if it doesn't make sense, it's because of jet lag. So ask, ask me and, uh, and I'll try to explain it better. So I'm gonna give four lectures um, in a series and um, I decided to do something a little bit unconventional. So in, instead of uh, giving all four lectures on the details of inflation and how to calculate quantum perturbations and so forth, I'm gonna condense that material down into the first two. And then in the last two lectures, I'm gonna tell you what are some of the problems with inflation, um, what are some of the controversial aspects of it, and uh, how does it fit into the bigger picture of theoretical physics, string theory, uh, cosmology, and so forth. So if you want, the first two lectures will be about how to do research on inflation. The last two lectures will be about what to do research on. What are the interesting questions? So a little bit more precisely, In lecture one, I'll review cosmology. And I'll describe the problems which led Alan Guth and others to propose inflation in the first place. So that will be today and possibly later today, depending on, <coughs> uh, well, this will be the first lecture, the lecture now. And uh, this lecture will possibly be later today, depending on Vitor's success in arriving. So in the second lecture, I'll describe how fluctuations emerge during inflation and eventually lead to structure so when people say structure in cosmology, we mean galaxies, stars, galaxies, clusters of galaxies. Um, the interesting stuff. And then in lecture three, which will be on Friday, I think three and four will both be on Friday if I'm not wrong. So in lecture three, I'll talk about some controversies and challenges for inflation. And in lecture four, about the big picture, which for me means uh, string theory, the landscape, <clears throat> and how inflation fits into that. Questions so far? So let me ask you this. How many of you have followed a course in general relativity? And how many of you have not? Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, I won't assume much knowledge of that, but, but I will use a little. <clears throat> All right, so let's start off with um, a definition of what is cosmology. So cosmology, it's the study of the universe on the largest scales in space and in time. So this means what was the origin of the universe? What's the fate of the universe? And what's its large scale structure? Um, and uh, if we want to talk about, <coughs> if we want to understand the answers to these questions, what was the origin and fate of the universe? What's its large scale structure? Inflation, affects all of these very strongly. <clears throat> so 
So it plays a key role in determining the answers to all of these, all of these questions. Now, um, we believe that the universe on these large scales is described by general relativity. Hence my question. So, um, in general relativity, as almost all of you know, <coughs> one tries to solve Einstein's equations. which take this form. Now, throughout these lectures, I'm going to use units where h bar is equal to c is equal to 1. <coughs> so if you want to restore the units, you just need to analyze the dimensions of the quantities you're looking at and multiply by the right number of powers of h bar and c to get the dimensions right. And there's always a unique way to do that. So you don't lose anything except, uh, well, you save some chalk uh, in, in, uh, in doing this. And G here is, um, is Newton's constant. It sets the strength of gravity. If G equals zero, there's no gravity. T mu nu is the stress, e stress energy tensor. And G mu nu is the Einstein tensor, which can be written like this. So um, R mu nu is the Ricci curvature. Um, and it's a function of G and its derivatives. R is the Ricci scalar, the trace of R, where trace means you can track the indices with g mu nu and then sum. And again, throughout these lectures, I'll use the standard Einstein summation convention. So if there's an index repeated, this is supposed to say mu nu, let me write it more, a little bit better. If you see a repeated index, then it's, um, it's summed over. And I won't write the sum. And g itself is a function of the coordinates, x mu. OK. Now, um, so g mu nu is the metric on some manifold. And I'll only be interested in uh, four-dimensional spacetime in these lectures. So g mu nu is a metric on some four-dimensional manifold, m. And because we're talking about cosmology, so we need to include both time and space. And so G has signature one comma three. Okay, so this means one direction, that'll be time, has signature plus, and three directions, which will be space, have signature minus. This is a convention. You, can, you could choose it to be uh, three comma one instead, and it makes no difference except for some minus signs in various equations. Um, but this way, if you want, distances in time are real, and distances in space are imaginary. Uh, um, anyway, that's the convention. And so this is uh, described as, people say it's a Lorentzian signature, because it's the same signature as Lorentzian spacetime, Minkowski spacetime. Um, and it's, it's pseudo-Riemannian is the term that mathematicians use. A Riemannian manifold would have 0, 4 or 4, 0. Anyway, so it's a, it's a space time. And um, more importantly, we have to be able to write it as a line times some <coughs> three dimensional uh, Riemannian manifold. OK, so this is time, and this is space. If we can't do that, it's not a cosmology. That's my definition of cosmology. Um, <clears throat> so this M3 is some uh, Riemannian 3 manifold. So it's Euclidean signature and um, it has some fixed topology which cannot change. Yeah? Slightly bigger? OK, uh, all right, I'll write larger. Um, there's a theorem. This is a theorem in classical general relativity. So it's probably not true in, in a quantum version. But in classical general relativity, 
there's a theorem that's due to um, Gerach in the 70s, it's called the splitting theorem, which says that, first of all, whenever you have a Cauchy problem, so whenever you have a well-defined initial value surface that you can evolve forward and backward in time, the space-time must split like this. And secondly, the topology of this spatial part can never change. It's basically because you can take the data on, on some initial time slice, and then you can evolve it forward. If the topology changed, there would be some kind of singularity. It would be impossible to evolve forward or back. So the, the proof is really that simple, just that you can apply a time evolution operator and evolve back to that initial surface, and that doesn't change the topology. <clears throat> Okay, so, so um, that's a good question. Um, so there's a famous class of examples, which are what you learn first when you study this topic, which are the so-called Friedman, Robertson, Walker, or sometimes Lemaitre gets added. Uh, <coughs> cosmologies. <coughs> and uh, these are cosmologies where one makes a very special and restrictive assumption that um, let's just say space is, has two properties. It's homogeneous and it's isotropic. So the motivation for making these assumptions is that they are nearly true in our universe at the largest scales we can observe. And I'll come back to that quite a bit later. So when we look on the largest scales we can see today, we see a universe which is nearly homogeneous and isotropic. What's the meaning of these terms? Homogeneous means the universe is the same at every point. And isotropic means it's the same in all directions. It's spherically symmetric. At first sight, you might think these are redundant with each other, but they're not. For instance, imagine you had a universe which is full of an electric field that's always pointing in some particular direction and has constant, uh, constant amplitude. So that would be homogeneous. At every point, it's the same, but not isotropic because this electric field chooses a direction. Conversely, you could have a universe which is spherically symmetric around some point, like where we are, um, but uh, where the density or some other quantity varies with radius. That would be isotropic, at least at that point, but it would not be homogeneous. Okay, so these are two distinct uh, features. In fact, it's rather difficult to test this one because after all, we're sitting at one point and we don't really have access to a full volume, we have access to our sky, which is telling us more about isotropy than it is about homogeneity. Um, <clears throat> however, it would be rather unreasonable to believe that the universe is spherically symmetric and centered on us. Um, and so the fact that it looks isotropic from our vantage point is a pretty good reason to believe that it's also homogeneous. And in fact, there are some tests of homogeneity that go beyond isotropy, <clears throat> which if we have time, we can discuss. curvature can change? Yes. Uh -huh. That's right. Yeah, good. Yeah, so, so um, fixing the, the topology of a three-manifold um, doesn't, it's a pretty weak, uh, has a pretty weak effect on the curvature. So, for example, um, if M3 is a sphere, a three-dimensional sphere, then for any function on a sphere, there exists a metric for which that's the curvature. So absolutely anything can be the curvature of, of a metric on, on S3. Can be positive everywhere, it can be negative everywhere, it can be positive some places, negative. So, so the topology doesn't have a very strong effect on the curvature, but it does have some effects. I'll actually come back to this in one of the last lectures. Um, but that's right, so, so fixing the topology certainly doesn't fix the metric, and it also doesn't fix the Ricci scalar uh, or the Ricci tensor, um, <clears throat> but it does have some implications. And one of those implications is that there are actually only four possibilities for which it's possible for space to be homogeneous and isotropic. People often say there are three because they forget one. There are four. Um, 
So if we want to make this assumption, M3 should be an element of the set S, where S is four uh, manifolds. So there's, um, there's S3, the three sphere. Where should I put the three? I'll put it here. There's a manifold, which is the one people forget, S3 mod Z2. There's R3, and there's H3. Okay, so what are these? S3 is a hypersphere. It's a three-dimensional analog of a sphere. Um, so it's a, it's a, it has finite volume. And if you move in any direction, you'll come back to where you started after a while. Um, <clears throat> it has no non-contractible, uh, sorry, all, all, all loops are contractible on S3, just like they are on S2. <coughs> S3 mod Z2, this is also known as RP3. It looks just like S3 locally. Uh, it's also compact, finite volume, um, but it has some non-contractible loops in it. And you can think of this as S3, where you identify antipodal points. Okay, so if you go halfway around the world, you're back to where you started instead of having to go the whole way around. R3, that's just Euclidean three-dimensional space, the usual, you know, uh, standard flat three-dimensional space that you're used to. And H3 is hyperbolic space. So this one, of course, has infinite volume. So does this one. Um, hyperbolic space is uh, um, a space in which uh, areas and volumes grow the same way, uh, at least for, for spheres that are larger than a certain size. Um, if you're familiar with the Poincaré disk or the Lobachevsky plane, uh, or I think it has another name, um, those are two-dimensional hyperbolic spaces. This is three-dimensional hyperbolic space. Anyway, these are the four um, topologies that M3 could have if it's going to be homogeneous and isotropic. Um, now, you might ask, I mean, there, there are lots of other possible topologies, infinitely many. For instance, you could take R3 and um, make it into a torus by just identifying some directions. So you can have a, a three-dimensional torus, T3. But this can never be isotropic. And to convince yourself of that, imagine a two-dimensional torus. So you can draw a two-dimensional torus by taking a plane and then identifying this line with this line and this line with this line. So the identification is straight across. So these two points are the same, these two points are the same, and also these two points are the same, and these two are the same. I suspect all of you are too young for this, but if you've ever played the game Asteroids, um, you're a little ship, you shoot bullets, there's some rocks you're trying to blow up, and when your bullets exit here, they reappear here, they exit there, they reappear there, so they wrap around. That's a game played on the surface of a torus. Okay, that's a torus. And uh, if you stare at this picture, you can see that it's not isotropic, because if I start from here and I shoot a bullet in that direction, it comes back and hits me after however long it takes to travel that distance. And that might be the same as this direction if it's a square torus. But if I shoot it along a diagonal, it may or may not hit me, but if it does, it'll take longer. Or it may not hit me at all, it may miss me. So different directions are not equivalent. And it's impossible to put a metric on the space that fixes that. It's just intrinsically not isotropic. So that's why there are only these four possibilities. And again, everybody tends to forget RP3 and say there are just these three. This is referred to as a closed universe, open, flat. OK. Um, good. Now, uh, it's important to say, and this is what the question was, was asking, that uh, even if the universe has one of these topologies, it does not mean that it's homogeneous and isotropic. So the implication goes the other way. If it's going to be homogeneous and isotropic, it has to be a member of this set. But being a member of the set does not guarantee that it's homogeneous and isotropic, because you can always put some matter in. Let's say you have your spherical universe. You can always have matter be concentrated in one place more than it is in another. Um, and if you do that, the metric will respond because of Einstein's equations. And so well, the metric itself will not, will not be homogeneous. There will be more matter in one place than another. Um, okay. And another thing to say <coughs> is that if the topology is not one of these, you can still be very close to homogeneous and isotropic because you can just make the universe very, very, very large 
so that, for instance, you'll never see this wrapping around phenomenon because it'll take too long. And in that case, you won't be able to distinguish this torus from just flat space. Okay, so, so, so it's not really um, motivated observationally to assume that, that the topology is one of these because you can always assume the universe is big enough uh, that, you, that you, won't, you won't notice um, the anisotropy induced by, by this other topology. Anyway, so, so that's... Uh, um, okay, so that's uh, FRW cosmology. And in fact, um, what does inflation do? So I'm going to come back to this in just a few minutes. But what inflation does is it blows the universe up and makes it really large, so large that all these effects of the topology can easily be far beyond our horizon and not observable. So inflation is a way of being sure that you don't care about the topology. Once it happens, um, if it lasts long enough at least, it makes the universe so large that you'll never be able to measure the topology and it simply won't matter what it is. Everything will look flat. Okay. But for now, let's assume the topology is one of these. So the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. And um, let's write the metric that goes along with that. Okay, so, so um, there are three possible um, spatial metrics here, all of which are homogeneous and isotropic. One of them corresponds to the closed cases, one to flat and one to open. So k is an integer that's plus one, minus one, or zero. And um, d omega 2 squared, that's the metric on a two sphere, so it takes this form. It's the standard round metric on a two sphere. Now to see that this metric actually describes what I said it did, let's take the case k equals plus 1. Then, um, if I define <coughs> a new coordinate psi as the inverse sine of r, um, then you can see this is going to become sine squared, uh, and this simply becomes deep psi squared. So, um, we just get this metric, and that is the metric on a three-sphere. Sorry, ask it again. Is it a, a square, did you say? Yeah, it's a square. The sigma, the three? This one. This one. Ah, sorry, sorry, that's a square. Sorry. Yes. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and this is also. OK. Um, yeah, so um, this is the metric on, um, on a three sphere. It looks just like the metric on a two sphere, um, except, well, this d phi squared is replaced by d omega two squared. Um, OK. Uh, and notice that the, the range of r is from. Um, is from zero, uh, uh, the, the range of psi, rather, is from zero to pi. Um, now, uh, if k is equal to minus one, then we can define sinh of psi equal to r. And um, this becomes a plus, and the metric becomes
hyperbolic sign. So now you can see this fact that I mentioned that areas and volumes grow the same at large, um, at large psi, psi bigger than about one. Um, well, maybe you can see. So uh, this grows exponentially with psi for large psi. Uh, so the, um, the size of, of the two spheres here grows very rapidly as psi increases. Okay, so that's hyperbolic space. And of course, for k equals zero, we don't have to do anything. Um, this is just flat space. Okay. Um, all right. So, so those are the uh, those are the three spatial topologies for homogeneous and isotropic cosmology. Now, um, I should have said this metric is a three sphere with radius one. Can people see the bottom of the board? Is that, can anyone not see the bottom? Okay. So this is a three sphere with radius one. Um, so when we multiply it by A, let's say with K equals plus one, this is a three sphere with radius A, A of T. Right, you just make it bigger by a factor of A. It's a not a squared because this is ds squared. It's a distance squared. Now, um, that means that we can think of this metric as describing a space, which in that case is a three sphere, which expands as time passes. Okay, so it's an expanding universe. Well, I shouldn't say it necessarily expands. Its size changes. We'll see in a moment um, that, well, typically it expands, and that in fact it will be almost impossible to have a of t constant. But in any case, its size changes with time. Let's just put it like that. Now, um, you might wonder if k is equal to zero, you already have an infinite volume flat space. What does it mean for that to expand? It's a question we're thinking about. Um, it might become a little more clear in a few minutes. It does mean something. Um, but in a way, it's convenient to think about this closed compact universe, it's a little bit easier to picture. And you can always make it so large that you can't distinguish it from flat space. Um, so that's, I think, if, if you find that confusing, you can always imagine that the universe is closed. And um, so it's really a, a finite volume thing that's, that's growing with time. So now if I take this metric, <coughs> and by the way, you should convince yourself that this metric um, suffices to describe a cosmology where the space is homogeneous and isotropic. Um, it's not very difficult. If you take this metric and you plug it back into Einstein's equations, which are way over there, um, the result is pretty simple. It has to be because there's only one function in the metric. There's only this A of t. Um, and what you find are two equations. One that depends on the first derivative of A. And um, another one, which depends on the second derivative of A. Um, so T uh, Okay, so T mu nu is a diagonal matrix. It has to be diagonal because any off-diagonal component um, would indicate some kind of anisotropy. If these components here were non-zero, so I should, maybe I should remind you that the zero, zero component of T is the energy density. The space-based components are pressures. Um, these components here 
along the top row. T is a symmetric matrix, so it's the same down here. These represent flows of energy. If you have a flow of energy, uh, the, uni the uh, universe is not isotropic because the flow is pointing in a particular direction. If you want, this is like a spatial vector, and you can't have any spatial vector non-zero if the universe is isotropic. Um, similarly, these represent anisotropies uh, <coughs> as well. And the diagonal elements have to be equal because otherwise there would be some, again, anisotropic component, something that selects out the different directions. So the spatial part of T has to be proportional to the identity matrix. That's the only rotationally invariant uh, three tensor. Okay, so, so T menu must take this form. And so we just have a row and a P. Um, and this is how they appear in these equations. Uh, dot means derivative with respect to time. And what else? This is the uh, zero, zero component of Einstein's equations. And this comes from the space space component. Remember, there's many of Einstein's equations <coughs> because there's a mu, mu nu index here. Um, but in this case, they reduce to just these two. Now, with some algebra, we can combine these two equations and write um, uh, the following, that rho dot is minus 3h rho plus p. And that equation follows directly um, from the definition of rho and p and then conservation of energy. Um, it actually just says, um, well, it says that p is minus dE by dV. So um, dE is minus p dV. That means dE by dT is minus p dV by dT. Uh, and E is rho times A cubed, or at least it's proportional to that. So take our spherical universe, the volume is proportional to A cubed, multiplied by rho, and that's the energy. Um, so that's E. V is proportional to A cubed with the same proportionality factor. And now if you just plug this in, you'll get this equation here. So um, the two Einstein's equations together enforce conservation of energy and momentum. Okay. Um, another thing to notice is this H, A dot over A. Note that it has units of one over time, <clears throat> which is one over distance since we said C equal to one. Okay, um, good. Uh, now, what do these equations tell us? Well, among other things, they tell us that it's very hard for the universe to be static. If you want a dot equal to zero, you need h to be zero, so this has to vanish, um, and um, so that's a very particular condition on rho. Um, and then if you want it to remain static, you need a, a double dot equal to zero. So you need rho plus 3p to vanish. Um, so you can arrange this to happen. Rho generally is positive. So we need k to be plus one in order to satisfy that. But then we also need p less than zero, which is strange. You can do this if, um, for instance, the universe is closed and rho consists of two components, ordinary matter and something called dark energy, which has the property, or let's say vacuum energy, which has the property that p, p vacuum, is minus rho. So if I choose rho vacuum to be positive, p is negative, and then it's possible to make this happen. So there does exist a static solution to these equations. 
but it's extremely unstable. If I add just a little bit of rho, then uh, this A dot will become positive and the universe will start to expand. If I decrease rho by just a little bit, A dot will be negative and it'll start to collapse. And that's only in the homogeneous case. So the homogeneous case is akin to this. It's like balancing a ball on the very top of an upside down parabola. Just the slightest perturbation will make it fall. If you allow inhomogeneities, it's even more unstable um, <clears throat> because inhomogeneities tend to grow and, uh, um, well, invalidate this whole analysis. So it's pretty much impossible to have a static solution to these equations. Cosmology must be time dependent. By the way, you all know the famous story that Einstein invented the cosmological constant so that he could find a static solution because he needed something like this to find it. He didn't notice that it was unstable. Okay. Um, <clears throat> good. Now, another thing to say about this, ordinary matter and radiation have rho and p positive, or at least non-negative. So this means, if that's the only thing in the universe, that a double dot is less than zero. <coughs> so if you have a universe that's expanding, a dot greater than zero, um, its expansion will be slowing down. And this is completely what you would expect. Gravity is an attractive force. You have a bunch of stuff in the universe which is flying apart. That's what it means for the universe to be expanding. Um, that stuff is attracting itself, and so its expansion is slowing down. Just like if you throw a rock in the air, um, its velocity, well, its speed decreases because it's attracted back towards the ground. Okay, so, so uh, A double dot is negative. Um, and what this implies is that the universe has a finite age, which was a shocking realization back in the day. So if we have A dot positive, so here's, I'm plotting A versus T, A dot is positive, um, and um, uh, A double dot is negative, it's curving down, right? That's what it would be if a double dot were zero. So it hits this axis at some finite time, which we can call t equals zero. And at that moment, a is zero. The universe has zero volume. That's a singularity, because uh, if we were to compute the, uh, the curvatures, we would find that they depend on time, and um, they depend on inverse powers of A, so they blow up when A goes to zero. When a curvature blows up in general relativity, um, you can no longer trust Einstein's equations. So you expect that Einstein's equations will be modified by something. So we don't really believe that we can trust this analysis all the way down to t equals zero at this singularity. Uh, but if we, if we do trust it, well, it tells us that there's this point where the volume vanishes. Okay, and this is, of course, called the Big Bang. By the way, um, that term was, was coined by, by Fred Hoyle, who was an eminent cosmologist. He made major contributions, very important contributions. But he hated this whole idea of an expanding universe. He fervently believed that the universe should be static. And uh, he believed that to the point that he went on a kind of publicity tour where he would give public lectures ridiculing the idea that the universe could be expanding. Um, uh, and uh, he, he, he made up this term to, just to make fun of this idea. Um, he was uh, more and more sort of ostracized by his contemporary physicists, but he became quite famous. He wrote books. Uh, so if you see people going around ridiculing ideas in modern cosmology, eminent cosmologists doing that, um, you might remember this story. Uh, it's an interesting cautionary tale. Anyway, um, okay, so, so, um, uh, so that's the Big Bang. So now, um, to help us solve these equations, um, let's take this continuity equation that's written over there. And let me make an assumption 
um, that uh, that the equation of state p over rho is constant in time. If I make this assumption, then um, I can rewrite this equation like this, just by dividing by rho. This is d log rho by dt, d log a by dt. So I can immediately integrate this and get that rho is some constant times uh, a to the power minus three, one plus w. So now let me do some, some cases. Um, w equals zero, so this means p equals zero. And this is usually called dust or pressureless dust. So it's like a bunch of particles that aren't moving. Um, they don't exert any pressure on the walls of a container because they're not moving. Um, <clears throat> so uh, with this value of w, we find that rho scales as a to the minus three. W equals a third um, gives us rho scales as a to the minus four. That's the equation of state of a gas of photons, of radiation. Uh, so this you can understand, this a to the minus three. It's very simple. You have some number of massive particles um, and um, a cubed is the volume. So if the number is conserved, then rho will decrease like one over volume, right? Rho is n over v, number of particles divided by volume. <clears throat> Similarly, this a to the minus four, you can understand um, because if you think of a gas of photons, the number is conserved as the space expands. So the number density goes like one over a cubed. But each photon redshifts as the space stretches. So the wavelength of each photon increases like A, and that means its energy goes down like one over A. Okay, so each particle loses energy as the space expands. So there's an extra factor of, of A. Um, and finally, if we choose um, W equals minus one, <coughs> so this is P equals minus rho, then we get rho is, not, is proportional to A to the zero. It's, it's constant. So W equals minus one is what's called vacuum energy because it's an energy density associated to um, each cubic centimeter of vacuum. It doesn't change as A expands, okay? So the total energy is increasing if rho is positive as the universe grows because its volume is growing. The energy density is remaining constant. So that's a very weird form of energy. All right. Um, good. So what about H? Um, oh yeah. Um, yeah, W bigger than one is um, perhaps possible, but it's pretty weird. Um, so, uh, <coughs> let's see, um, if we plug it in here, right, um, it just means, it, it, doesn't look, it doesn't look odd here, it would just tell you that A redshifts very, very rapidly. Um, but it's a very stiff equation of state. Uh, um, there's sort of more pressure than energy uh, when you include the Cs. Um, so, it, there's no ordinary form of stuff that has that equation of state. Um, but whether it's really inconsistent, I don't know, it's uh, not entirely clear, I would say. The, sp the speed of sound is often related to W, right? So uh, naively, at least, W bigger than one would give you a speed of sound that's greater than one, and that means faster than light, hmm? It's not perfect. Yeah, exactly, so, so it depends, it's really, DP, uh, it's really DP by D rho that matters, that's right. Um, so if it's a perfect fluid, it would have speed of sound that's greater than one, and that's certainly problematic, but there might be some other stuff that, uh, uh, that has speed of sound less than or equal to one and, and still effectively has P greater than, greater than rho. Um, okay. Um, now, in, in our real universe, we don't have just one type of stuff. 
We have matter, which is non-relativistic and effectively pressureless. Um, we have radiation, and it seems we have vacuum energy. <coughs> so the actual universe contains all these components, which means, um, oh, I should do one other thing, sorry. I should solve for A as a function of time before I say that. Um, right, so, so we have that uh, um, H squared. Um, <coughs> let's, let's take A to be T to the D. So then H, which is A dot over A, is D over T. So H squared And now, um, if uh, I plug in these scalings for rho, I have some constant, a to the minus 3, 1 plus w. And so if I invert this uh, and solve for a, I find that a is proportional to t to the 2 over 3, 1 plus w. OK, so uh, in the case w equals 0, we have A is proportional to T to the two-thirds. Here we have A is proportional to T to the one-half. And here, it looks like we have T to the infinity. Well, actually, what we get is E to the T times some constant H. OK, T to the infinity is sort of like an exponential, just like T to the zero is like a log. <coughs> OK. so so. Um, so those are the uh, scalings. That's how the, the universe grows. Under the, uh, if, it's, if it's filled with a fluid or filled with a substance that has uh, these different values of W. Notice that um, for both matter and radiation, it's T to a power less than 1. That means A double dot is negative. right? So the universe is expanding but slowing down. But for vacuum energy, it's E to the TH. A double dot is positive, H squared. And so the universe is accelerating. It's expanding more and more rapidly. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 I, I forgot to say. Yeah, so everything I've written on the board is valid. Well, everything is written on, I've written on the board is valid with k equals 0. Some things are valid also with k not equal to 0. But yeah, here I've, I've ignored the, the k over a squared term, just for simplicity. We know in the universe we live in that um, this k over a squared term is much smaller than the rho term, at least today. And it was therefore much smaller, and I'll come back to this in a moment, going all the way back into the past, except possibly in the very early universe. So uh, it's a pretty good approximation to ignore it um, in our universe, and I'll, I'll do that in some things I'm saying just for simplicity. <clears throat> anyway, so our universe contains a bunch of things, not just one type of, uh, uh, of, of stuff. And so the actual... Um, Dependence of A on T is much more complicated, not much more, but it's more complicated than this. But it's easy to work out. If the right-hand side of this equation contains a sum of terms like this, it's not difficult to, to solve. Uh, and what you find is that as the universe expands, it goes through various phases. So um, this here has the most negative power of A. If these are the three components, this has the most negative power of A. So the smaller the universe is, the more important this term is. Right, as the universe gets smaller, radiation gets denser, like matter, but also each photon gains energy. So this dominates. The early universe, you expect then to be radiation dominated and to grow like t to the 1 half. At a certain point, radiation redshifts past uh, where matter is. So if there's some radiation and some matter, at a certain point, matter will come to dominate. And from then on, the universe will grow like t to the 2 thirds until, if there's any dark energy or vacuum energy, that comes to dominate, and then it will grow exponentially. And in the history of our universe that we know of, um, well, those three periods we know very well. There was a period of radiation domination, then a period of matter domination, and now we live in a period of what seems to be vacuum energy domination. <coughs> Hello, what time do I finish? Okay. Okay, good. So, any questions on this? Ah, um, it's pretty strong. Um, it's not true for, uh, 
for just about anything in, in detail. Um, so for example, if you have some massive, massive particles which are moving relativistically because they're hot, then their W is not zero, it's more like uh, a third. Um, and then as they cool, they start to behave as um, pressureless dust. So um, if you really want to do this properly, you should take all of that into account. Um, but it's not very difficult to do for most forms of, 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 uh, of matter and radiation. Um, but it does make the, the solutions more complicated than this. Okay, so, so um, very good. So let's talk about causality. Uh, in, <coughs> in general relativity, light is affected by gravity um, and it moves at finite speed. So let's work out how a, uh, a ray of light or any massless particle would propagate in this metric. So again, I'll take k equals zero. Actually, let's write it in spherical coordinates. And let's consider a radial light ray. So a null, a light particle follows a null, geode follows a null geodesic, assuming it doesn't scatter off of anything. A null geodesic has ds squared equals zero, zero proper length. So this means that dt is plus or minus a dr <coughs> for a radial geodesic. If I integrate both sides of this, divide by a and integrate both sides of this equation, I find that delta r is the integral dt over a. So this is the distance in these coordinates that light moves. If I integrate it from zero up to some time t, it's the distance that light moved from the Big Bang up until some time. Okay. So, for instance, um, suppose the universe was radiation dominated all the, all the time. So, if A is t to the one half, um, then when you integrate this, you'll get uh, Something like that. And so um, what you see is that this, uh, this distance grows with time. Okay? And it's finite, crucially. There was a question. Can you, can you raise your hand? Sorry, I'm having trouble seeing it. Ah, there you are, yeah. Sorry, uh, T times H, ah, uh, over here? Yeah, uh, you mean you're asking about this equation maybe, or this one, here, yeah. Um, good, so, so H in this equation um, is eight pi G over three times rho lambda. Okay, so this is the energy density of the vacuum times this constant, that's what H is. And if I, if I plug in uh, A to the left-hand side, um, and take two derivatives, um, uh, and, and then divide by A, then, I, then it satisfies this equation. Is that clear? Here? Oh, yeah, this is not true. This is not true for, um, this is only true for W not equal to minus one. Yeah. Yeah, no, indeed. And in fact, it's very important that it's different when W is minus one. That's the whole point. We'll, we'll, we'll get there in a minute. Thanks for, uh, for pointing that out. Good. Okay, so, so uh, right, so, so, so assuming radiation domination for the moment, we find that light travels this distance um, after a time t. Now, uh, notice that um, this coordinate r, it's the thing that's multiplied by a, right? So, so if this was a, a, if I did k equals plus one, this would be a sphere of radius one. So you can think of this coordinate r as kind of like some tick marks on, this, on the universe. 
And as the universe expands or shrinks, tick marks remain in the same positions. Okay, so delta r is some distance like this, that same distance here. So this coordinate r here, or this distance delta r, is called a co-moving distance. Co-moving. Co-moving. It's not a physical distance. It doesn't change. It's the same delta r in these two pictures. It doesn't change as a grows. A times delta r is a physical distance. It's the distance you would measure with a meter stick or something. <coughs> um, OK, so this is the co-moving distance that light can travel after time t. Now, um, what does it mean? Well, it means that, again, imagine the universe was a sphere. Now, you might complain that I neglected the k over a squared term when I calculated this. That's true. But uh, never mind that for the moment. Imagine the universe is a sphere. If we get to large enough t, this delta r will reach pi, okay, which would mean that the light has traveled halfway around, or it will reach 2 pi. Eventually, it will travel all the way around. So in a universe <coughs> which is decelerating, if you wait long enough, light will have propagated everywhere around the whole universe. Okay, or if it's an infinite volume universe, it will propagate an arbitrarily large distance. So what does this mean? Um, well, um, it means that more and more of the universe gets connected to itself. Okay, so imagine that the universe, when it was born, was not in thermal equilibrium. Suppose it was hotter in one part and colder in another part. For two regions to come into equilibrium, so let's say this is hot over here, cold over here. For two regions to come into equilibrium, there has to be an exchange of energy. There has to be time for particles to propagate from one region to the other. So that can only happen at a sufficiently late time. OK? Good. Now, um, hold that thought. Another comment about H. Um, if I take the physical, um, this is, by the way, it's called the particle horizon. So this is called the, this delta R is called the particle horizon. So if I look at this A times delta R um, and um, plug it in over here, so A times delta R um, is uh, T to the 1 half times this 2 times T to the 1 half. So it's 2T. And that is 1 over H. So um, 1 over H. Um, is two things. First of all, it's the age of the universe, or, well, twice the age of the universe in this case. And it's also the distance, the physical distance, that light can travel from the Big Bang until now. Okay, so it defines two things: the size of the universe, the size of the of the universe that's affected by um, uh, by one point, and um, also its age, roughly. Okay, there's a factor of two. All right. So now uh, let me explain the horizon problem. Cosmology. So. Let's suppose that the universe was radiation dominated all along. So let's just ignore matter and dark energy. <coughs> Putting them in would change a few numbers a little bit, but um, otherwise would have very little effect on this discussion. So here is t equals zero. This is a singularity, so let's make it spiky. 
Um, and here is today. Today is usually denoted T sub zero. So um, if you consider yourself sitting at some point today and you ask, what parts of the universe can you see? We can draw some lines back towards the Big Bang. These wouldn't really be straight in these coordinates. It's t to the 1 half, so they should have some curvature. But um, we draw them back to this t equals 0 surface. And, um, and what we can see today, in principle at least, is all the stuff in this region of the universe. So there's some delta r here. That's the co-moving distance that light traveled. So it traveled from here to here, it traveled delta r. On the other hand, let's consider some very early time. Let's call it t initial. So this region here has access only to this part of the initial conditions. And this region here has access only to this part of the, of, of this, of the universe, and so forth. Right, delta r is much smaller back then. So what you see is that the state of the universe at this early time um, is affected by many disconnected pieces. It splits apart into many disconnected volumes which have not had time to communicate to each other. So imagine we can <coughs> measure the temperature of the universe at this time. Would we expect it to be the same everywhere along here? It depends on what you believe about the initial conditions. But if there was any inhomogeneity in the initial conditions, if there was any variation in temperature or density in the early universe, it wouldn't have had time to thermalize. Because this region and this region and this region, they never talk to each other. They're completely disconnected causally at this point. And in fact, in cosmology, we can do precisely this. We can look back and we can measure the temperature using the cosmic microwave background of the universe at an early time. <coughs> and, um, and what we see is that the temperature is almost exactly the same. It only varies by one part in 100,000. It probably varies by less than the temperature in this room. Yeah. Why would we or would not? Why would we? Uh, I'm not sure what to expect. Um, you know, no, so no, no one really knows what the initial conditions should have been. And indeed, when we come back to the sort of controversies about inflation, this is one of them that we'll discuss. Um, but, well, it would be odd if the initial conditions were almost perfect but not quite perfect homogeneity. So what we're going to learn is that inflation provides a mechanism that essentially no matter what the initial conditions were, produces a universe that looks just like the one we see. So without inflation, you'd have to assume that the initial conditions are exactly right to produce what we see. You wouldn't have any mechanism to explain it. So we'll come back to this uh, quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what it sounds like, but when you work out the math, that's not what you find, right? So, so, so let's, let's not actually go to the Big Bang. Let's go to this early time, because the Big Bang is a singularity, so it's a little hard to talk about. So then the universe is not really a point. It has finite size. And what we can see is that these regions can't talk to each other until a much later time, right? So for example, this guy and this guy can only communicate way up there. So if we go all the way back to the Big Bang, it is confusing. It's a singularity. It has zero volume. It's hard to know what to say. But we probably shouldn't do that anyway. We should go back to some very early time, but not quite all the way back. Yeah. No, I mean, I wouldn't expect any of the equations I wrote to be valid literally at t equals 0. In particular, general relativity is almost certainly not valid. So we know from quantum mechanics that there should be large corrections to it. Uh, before a certain time. So yeah, I, w I wouldn't trust it at t equals zero. But I would trust it at some early time here. Right, so, or at least, there's no reason not to. Uh, okay. Um, good. So, 
how many in this picture, it looks like about, I don't know, 10, but how, ma how many of these volumes are actually there? Well, of course, it depends on what we choose for T initial. So let's choose the Planck time, which is <coughs> 10 to the minus 43 seconds. The motivation for choosing that is that we certainly can't trust these equations before that. So that's as far back as we can go. The Planck time is the time when, um, well, the energy density of the universe will be of order the Planck density. It's the time when um, large corrections to general relativity certainly kick in. So we certainly can't trust GR before this time. If we go back to that time, um, then um, we said that um, the particle horizon grows like t to the 1 half. So delta R of t naught divided by delta R of t Planck is um, the age of the universe today. Anybody know what it is in seconds? You can remember it like this. It's 10 to the 10 years, right? Roughly 10 billion years, 10 to the 10. And a year is pi times 10 to the 7 seconds. So it's about 10 to the 17 seconds. Okay, so 10 to the 17 seconds divided by 10 to the minus 43 to the 1 half. Um, <clears throat> so this gives us about 10 to the 30. That's linear scale. If we want to know how many volumes are in there, then I should cube this. So there's about 10 to the 90 uh, causal volumes, or Hubble volumes, let's just say, inside this cone here. Remember, this is really three-dimensional, so. OK, so there's about 10 to the 90 different regions in there. Actually, if you include matter and dark energy, you get more like 10 to the 80. Okay, but it's a very big number. So why do they look all the same? There's another problem, which we're going to see is almost, it's very closely related, uh, called the flatness problem. Yeah. Uh, here? Here. Uh, 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Sorry, sorry. I'll try to write bigger. Okay, let's talk about the flatness problem. So let me put the curvature back, the curvature term back in. So we have h squared and now it's convenient to take this equation and divide both sides by h squared. Like that. And um, this is called omega total. This is called omega k. Um, so we have 1 equals omega total plus omega k. Note that omega k is negative when k is positive. That's some annoying convention. Um, but anyway, it looks like this. Uh, or omega k. But absolute value science is 1 minus omega total. Okay, and by the way, this omega total contains all the, all the rows. So it's got row matter, row radiation, row lambda, if there is one. Now, we know from observation that this can be no bigger than about 10 to the minus 2. Okay, that's why I said we can ignore it. In the universe today, this term is at most about 1%, about 10 to the minus 2. So now let's go back. That's today. So let's go back to this time T Planck and see what happens. So what happens to omega k? Well, it's, it scales like 1 over ha squared. And um, for radiation domination, a is t to the 1 half, h is 1 over t. So this goes as t. So if I go back, excuse me, if I go back um, and I evaluate omega k at t equals t Planck, it's about 10 to the minus 60, 
which is certainly a small number. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, what does that mean physically? Well, there's a nice way to think about omega k. Um, so, um, if I write a h as a divided by one over h, I can't stop me from doing that. Um, so this here, this is the uh, the radius of the Hubble volume. So it's effectively the size of the universe, the physical size of the universe um, that you can see. And this is the radius of the whole universe. It's the radius of curvature. Remember, in the closed universe, A was literally the radius of that sphere. So this is the ratio, AH is the ratio of the radius of the universe divided by the Hubble length, divided by the part you can see. Okay, so if you want, it's the size of the universe divided by the size of the observable universe. Okay, now AH is one over the square root of omega k. <coughs> so the fact that observation tells us that omega k is less than 10 to the minus 2 tells us that AH is greater than about 10. Okay, so what we know today is that if the universe has a curvature, if it's a sphere, the radius of that sphere is about 10 times bigger than, our, than the observable universe, than our Hubble, Hubble uh, volume today. Hmm? 10 because it's the square root, it's one over the square root of omega k. Um, and now if we go back to this time t Planck, it tells us that the radius of the universe back then, so this is AH today, if we go back to t Planck, um, then it would be about 10 to the 30, square root of 1 over 10 to the minus 60. So it would say that the size of the universe back then was 10 to the 30 times in linear scale the Hubble length back then. Or if you cube it to get a volume, you would get 10 to the 90 Hubble volumes per universe. Okay, so it says that the universe back then was much, much, much bigger than this causal size. So there's another way of looking at this flatness problem. So how did it get so big? How did it get so flat? And you can, again, you can say this either way. You can say, what set this number to be so tiny, this omega k back at this early time to be so tiny? Or if you look at it this way, it says, what says that the total size of the universe, which is at least this big, is so much bigger than the characteristic scale at that time, than the Hubble length at that time? Okay, so these are two ways of saying the same thing. And uh, these problems are very closely related I mean, you'll notice it's exactly the same number, um, or pretty close anyway. Um, what it really says is that uh, without inflation, the universe had to be very, very flat and very, very homogeneous on scales much longer than uh, C times T, where T is its age, much longer than the light crossing time of the universe, uh, the, the, the distance light could travel back then. Okay, so I should finish, um, and um, unless there's any last questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah, that's true. I cheated a little bit. Yeah, so when I derived um, the scaling of A, I assumed K was zero, and now I'm taking it not to be zero. Right. So, so um, the only time that will matter is when this term becomes large compared to this term. In other words, if we keep this term, but it's small compared to rho, it won't change very much, the solution we found for A. So it'll be pretty close to T to the one-half. Uh, at sufficiently late times, that will no longer be true, because this term will grow larger than this one. So in the late universe, this t to the one-half is not correct anymore, and there's a slightly different solution. But in the early universe, it doesn't matter. And since the universe today has this small compared to this, 
it really doesn't matter much. But you're right, we could do a more careful job where we take both terms into account. It wouldn't change anything. This number wouldn't change at all. Uh, not this one, but this one. Um, just because it's, it's completely irrelevant in the early universe. But yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would say yes, there is a difference. They enter Einstein's... Uh, yeah, the question was if there's a difference between vacuum energy and cosmological constant. Uh, so Einstein added a term, um, I erased it, but he thought of it as a term on the left-hand side of his equation, so part of the, part of the geometric, uh, you know, part of the curvatures, um, which was lambda times d mu nu. And so he, that was the cosmological constant. If you shift that term over to the right, then it looks like it's part of t mu nu. Of course, it's the same. So in that sense, they're identical. However, uh, vacuum energy is not necessarily uh, fixed forever, right? It's something that can change. For instance, you might have multiple vacua in a theory, multiple uh, stable phases, which have different vacuum energy. So you can have theories with multiple possible values of the vacuum energy. But strictly speaking, there's only one cosmological constant. So they're not exactly the same, but, but uh, they, as, long as, as long as vacuum energy doesn't change, they play exactly the same role in the equation. More questions? Okay, so I think we have a coffee break. Yeah. If anybody has more questions, you can talk to me then. So thank you. Thanks.